So two months ago, um, Etienne Blom, prophetic ministry, came here and had a word for us. And the word was to get right with God, just fall in love with Him again, just renew our relationship with Him. That was a strong word. And the other one was to build a church. You know, God in a way wanting to prepare us because He wants to go to another step. Just a new season where he wants he wants to move and do something. Now, probably the you know, I preached a few messages on it already, and the previous messages were pretty much on our heart and getting right with God. And there's probably more coming up um, because that's our primary need. And I'm not going to preach on that today because today is going to be very different. I'm going to ask. So if God wants to build a church, what is it going to look like? How do you organize a church? How do you function as a church? Are there systems, processes we have to be in place? Administration even. You know, some of you know, may think it's boring, but it's crucial. How does it going to look like in a church? So I'm, I'm going to go there this morning, but I just want to spend just one minute. If you hear the word of God and you're responding to it, and you're drawing closer to God, and you want to get rid of your lukewarmness, and, you know, um, Etienne Blom said bench warming, and just, you know, stepping up again in your relationship with God, so you're moving in that direction. What's the first thing that's going to happen? There's going to be fight back. There's going to be resistance. There's, you're going to be a little bit in warfare, right? So... It, and if that happens individually, it also happens it's in the church, right? So there's warfare. Can, can I encourage you not to lose sight that God is speaking to you? And it's about your heart. So I, I, I really I don't even know what's going on, but I get to just stuff, you know, there's lots on the grapevine. Can I encourage you? This is a season, it's you and God, it's your heart. You, you may just for a little while just not worry about anyone else. Just it's the call is on each and every one of us. You know, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you serve me? Okay. Now, this is this is really the, the first sermon I preach on it. Maybe it's the only one, but we're going to have a meeting next Saturday just to inquire and start a process, probably outside from Sunday preaching. Um, how do you build a church? How should we function? Um, like previous Sundays, the, the main inspiration that I'm drawing from is the account of the early church in Jerusalem. That's when the Holy Spirit fell, and that's the very first church that formed in Jerusalem. And those summary descriptions of what they did, I think it's still instructive for us today. And, um, and then in church history congregation I look at is the one in Korea, Seoul, Seoul, Korea, the Yodo Full Gospel Church that started so in the 1960s and then in 50 years grew from zero to more than 800,000 church members. So that's the biggest local congregation in the world. Maybe there are a few lessons for us to learn. And I start with that. So... The senior pastor of that church was um, Pastor Yonggi Cho. Pastor Yonggi Cho, very driven, very goal-orientated, ambitious young pastor. You know, there he was, he had nothing, and then he was believing God for 150, 150. He got that. So he thought, wow, this works. You exercise faith, you follow God, you preach the gospel. Wow, 150. And then he was believing for 300. Yeah, faith. Believing, praying, all of that, he got 300. Well, then he went for 3,000. So, again, he's working hard, he's baptizing everyone himself, he's visiting everyone, he's visiting the sick, he's door knocking, he's preaching, he's praying, he's just doing everything. Driven, absolutely driven. And he gets to the number of 2,700 in the church, and then it's collapse. Total collapse. So he, he's the pastor of the church that prays for healing and preaches healing, whatever. But he's in the middle of preaching. He just faints and is gone. 
She says, oh, that can't happen. Not to me. He tries the next service. Lasts four minutes. Faints again. He got heart cramps. Um, he's losing consciousness. He's almost delirious. Um, suffers from memory loss. Um, feels like dying every day. His nervous system is completely shot because he's just overdone it and was so ambitious to grow a church. And he used all of his energy and then it was finished. He was burned out. And that's when the story really starts. So the senior pastor of a church that worships on average 2,700 is at home in bed, lying flat on his bed, can't even leave the unit because he just can't walk upright. So how do you pass a church with that? Right, so he lies on, you know, flat on his bed and he's discouraged. In and out of discouragement, all he does is praying, napping, praying, napping, praying, napping. How do you lead the church? And so he prays and suddenly he has this idea that God says to him, let my people go and grow. Uh, you, use the people in the church to grow the church. And, and he found this verse in Ephesians chapter 4 where it says that the church leadership is not to do everything himself, but they are to equip the body of Christ. You know, apostles, prophets, and teachers, and pastors, and evangelists, you know, the five different giftings, all of them are meant to equip the body, and they are meant to do So equip, release them, and let the people do the work. And then he was inspired by... The same passages we are inspired in in Acts when it describes the early church, that when the Holy Spirit fell, how did they do church? And he reads it again and he discovers that they don't only have a big meeting on Sunday where everyone, everyone comes together, they also have meetings in people's homes. And so he's scratching his head. He's never even considered the idea. This was groundbreaking, totally novel. No one's doing it. But he thought, maybe we can use people's homes for church. And so he thought this novel idea, equip people, they're not just meeting the Sunday gathering, but what if they all met in small groups and started caring for one another in small groups and started inviting the, new, the, 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 the unbelievers to uh, small groups and they become Christians there and do it this way. And so, wow, he, he got a bit excited. He thought God had spoken to him and he got this revelation. So he went to the deacon's board, you know, the board of elders. He went to the board of elders and he, he, he revealed it to them. This is, I think, what God has shown me. This is what the Bible says. It's in the Bible. And then he had other passages where, you know, throughout the New Testament, people, the church met in people's houses, in people's homes. I mean, that, you know, to you it may be just, oh, what's the big deal? But 60 years ago in Korea, no one thought of that. It was a totally novel idea. This is how the elders responded. Yes, it's not such a bad idea, and we can see it's in the Bible, but, you know, we're not trained and we're too busy. It's just like, you know, we work all, all week. Our, our, our timetable is chock-a-block. I mean, I come home tired. I don't want to just have an, you know, my home is my sanctuary. I don't want to have, you know, a bunch of strangers coming in. Just, no, this is too hard. Huh. Camp the idea, so that was their response. So he goes home, lies in bed again, and says, what do we do now? What do we do now? And then with his uh, future mother-in-law and himself, and they thought, you know, God was in it. They thought about using women as leaders of small groups. Now, this is Korea, 60 years ago, male-dominated culture. This is, you know, you want to you have women leading, you know, these house cell groups, house, this is, he said, God, you want to wreck our church? <laughs> the, the whole society will be against us. Women are not allowed to do things like that. And, say, and God says, well, that's your idea. <laughs> My idea is to build a church. So he used women, and yes, that was a little bit resisted, but then it worked. And then I found interesting, uh, I think when Roland Baker was here, he said in China, where, you know, there are 80 to 100 million Protestant Christians, 99% of leaders of those house churches are women. 
Well, even if it's 95%, I'm a bit upset. <laughs> Come on, where are the men? Like, but, okay, God's plan. So they, um, women start doing it. They start meeting, and the plan gets released to the church. We're all going to be now in cell groups because the senior pastor is just not up to it. He's burnt out in a wreck. But we're going to grow. <laughs> like, this is crazy. So, okay, they have all these small groups and these you know, women that put their hand up and they want to lead. And the first hurdle to overcome is that people don't want to do it. I think 20% of the church, you know, the first week met in small groups, which basically, if we translate it to living grace, we got this grand new idea that God wants to build a church here and 40 people show up. <laughs> Would we go home discouraged or encouraged? A little bit discouraged, hey. <laughs> but I, I watched this video of this other preacher, you know, like said, I'm responsible of, of 5,000 churches. You know, if you think you'll be discouraged, you know, I got far more on my plate. And he said, take your right thumb, take your right thumb and just put it underneath your chin and push it up. <laughs> Praise Jesus. <laughs> it's not bad advice sometimes. So only 20%. But, you know, Korea is a bit top-down in society. When the leader says, you meet, you meet. So they've overcome that hurdle. And, um, you know, more and more, and more people jo join the cell groups. And then before long, you couldn't even join the church unless you actually joined a cell group. That's how the church began to function. Uh, another, you know, the story I tell really is very quickly. They had seven major hurdles to overcome. Uh, another one was that the, um, the small group leaders were not trained. You know, they were all keen to do and serve, but they didn't know how. They were not, you know, Bible teachers or preachers or anything. And then Yonggi Cho had this idea that he just prepared study notes from the sermon that he preached on Sunday, and he communicated separately with the small group leaders, you know, maybe just cassettes at the time just a bit of uh, instruction, cassette, they could listen to it. And they gave them the sermon notes that they could just follow and, and study so they didn't have to uh, produce those notes themselves. And then he gave a short worship order what they were actually to do. You know, opening prayer and maybe sharing a testimony and then go through that and do that. And um, so with that, anyone could do it. And it started to thrive. And another problem was that it took too long. You know, you invite people into your home, and if it's at night, you prepare supper, and then a bit more supper, and you catch up, and you have fun, and before you know it, it takes two, three hours for home group, and everyone is just dead tired the next day, whatever. So Yonggi Cho, after a while, he said, you've got to be finished in an hour, and no food. So maybe Bicky at the end, but you know, no food. Because if you start with food and entertaining, it's just way too long and it's not going to happen. And, and then also an hour, an hour, that surprised me. Do you know that our young adults group meets at our place? We start at 7 and finish at 11. <laughs> yeah, that's not an hour. <laughs> like where we, um, people can go home maybe after one half or two hours. But like, we, it's good fun. So, Yonggi Cho says an hour. And it's a Pentecostal church. You would say, oh, you've got to follow the Spirit. You can't put time limits to it. Law. Yeah, he did. He did, and it worked. And when you think about it, an hour is better than not meeting at all. People say, oh, I haven't got time. Oh, we got an hour. So, he stuck to an hour. And then the other problem was, it's a nice problem. I wish we will have that problem. Saying that you know people got really cozy with one another and got to know each other. And then they didn't, when the, when the group multiplied, grew bigger and bigger and bigger, they didn't want to separate. They didn't want to multiply the groups. They wanted to stick together. But when you meet in homes, your living room is only that big. So Yonggi Cho made the rule... Once it hits 15 families, you've got to split. Rule. So, okay, there were more, more hurdles, but you get the idea. 
And I'm, I'm just telling you those hurdles because we may have the same. And also, if it, the idea is from God, you know, we're going through this process and trying to find out, God, how do you want to do it here at Living Grace? And we say, God, this is your idea. And then we go for it and it doesn't immediately work. That's not necessarily a sign that this is not from God. Do you hear me? Because sometimes you say, oh, when the idea is of God, everything should just sailing through it and just no problem. No one will object. Everything's just going to take off immediately. Didn't work for Yonggi Cho like that. They had hurdles to overcome, a culture to change. There was resistance to it. There was a flat out no from the leadership. But they followed Jesus and they grew to 800,000 800, plus people. And, um, okay. Now, all over the world, people got um, really inspired by Yonggi Cho. He traveled all over the world. He taught it all over the world. People got into small groups in a big way. Uh, all over the world, in different nations, they started copying him and trying to do it exactly like he did. But I want to read to you again what inspired him from the Bible. And uh, I'll read you that passage, and I want to ask the question, do we have to copy him? Do we have to do it exactly like they do it in Seoul, Korea? No. 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 But uh, I'm proving it to us. Right? I'm proving it to us. Okay, I'll read. According to my numbering, I pick up eight major differences between the Bible account and how Yonggi Cho ended up doing it. So see whether you pick up a few as well. So Acts chapter 2. They, so the first believers in Jerusalem, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together together with glad and sincere hearts. So from that passage, what Yonggi Cho took away was that there were two meetings, two types of meeting. One where everyone came together and then there were the smaller ones. Okay, but how did he do it differently from the Bible account? Did he? Yes, yes. They were around the table. That was the main deal. They were having meals together. And I would probably hazard to say it took more than an hour. Once you start getting into dinner, it takes a while. Okay, yeah, major difference. Yeah, they didn't. Yeah. The, even the big gathering in the temple courts was daily. And, you know, Yonggi Cho, like most churches, they only came together, big gathering, on a Sunday. Yes? They shared their property. Yeah. Yes, I didn't even touch that. That happened to some extent, Yonggi Cho, in small groups as well. They, the Christians did help one another. Uh, I, mean, you know, I didn't mention it, but Yonggi Cho, they had signs and wonders. But there's a, one big difference probably there. While in the Bible account it says the apostles performed in the beginning the signs and wonders and the new Christians came in because of the apostles' work, in Yonggi Cho, all the converts, most of the converts came in through the work of the small groups. Which is again a huge difference. A lot of churches, they have small groups because they say, we're going to close the back door. Have you heard that? expression you know like you know a visitor comes to the church he really likes he really likes the church he likes what's happening sunday morning but because there are no friendships being formed you just lose that person again because you know if, if you're not in a small group anywhere you just remain anonymous and closing the back door is how do you keep someone or or um, facilitate that that person becomes part of the community have small groups that's one purpose of small groups, but that's not the one, the key main one that Yonggi Cho had for small groups. Yonggi Cho used small groups for evangelism. Have you ever been in a small... Who has been in a small group over the years? Yeah, plenty. Plenty. It's key. 
did your small group ever have as a major goal evangelism? That's one. Is that all? Put your hand up. Did you ever have as a small group, was your goal to have new people come to the small group or was it mainly Bible study for Christians? One, two. So that's... You, you as well, evangelism. Go for it. I've never been in one that had evangelism as the goal. Usually the ones I attended, they were just for Christians. And they served a good purpose. But like, I, I like the idea of evangelism. Okay, more differences. Uh, it's not expressly. I mean, they broke the bread. They probably had Holy Communion. I think Yongi Cho, they probably had communion as well. So, Growing leaders. Uh, it doesn't talk about it there, but one difference is there that the early church, they gathered around the apostles at the big meeting. So basically there was a team of top leaders while in Seoul, Korea, it was really only Yong Gi Cho. It's just one man on the top and not a team of people in, on the top. I think that, that is a big difference. Um, in the Bible, it's not said that women were the main leaders. Um, it, it was mixed, so men did their share as well. Um, another big one is that in the Bible, probably the meetings, the gatherings were spontaneous. I don't think the um, the apostles organized small groups for the church. They just people spontaneously meet in the homes, and they didn't use study notes that the apostles prepared. So you know, it was more free flowing. Okay, have I have I gotten eight? It's probably enough. So really, my whole point of it is that uh, Yongi Cho was inspired by the Bible account. He, he did recognize that God worked with two types of meeting, the big one and the small one. But the way he fleshed it out, you know, he was led by the Spirit and there's liberty. So there's liberty for us to do it how God wants us to do it here. Okay, we agree on that. How does God want us to do it here? It's a genuine question because I don't know. So, yeah, yeah, we, we train people into all their giftings, but you know, how do the small groups work? And uh, you know, I'm preaching it, I get us to think about it. I'm going to um, talk about two principles that are the core of it, but this is, this is actually the work for us as a church. We've got to hear from God. How is it going to look here? And it's not, it's, you know, I, it's not my job. I think it would be totally wrong if, if I said this way. It's, we've got to do this together as a church. But I just expanded a bit. There may be some of you that say, hey, we don't have to worry about it. Hey, no, I would love it if you were right. That would make my job so much easier. You know, I read it in, in, in the Bible. It says, hey, we appoint the deacons. And the apostles just, you know, we pray and we are into the word. Man, that's my favorite. So I preach on Sunday. We meet on Sunday. We have a serve. And everything else happens spontaneously. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> so don't worry about it. It's just going to be by itself. The Holy Spirit is just going to, and everyone will know what they're doing. And you, do, you don't need to give anyone instruction or teaching. Dreaming. Dreaming, yes. <laughs> Dreaming. All throughout history, it's been really clear that, you know, when the move of the Holy Spirit comes, you know, he brings the people, he brings the masses. But un unless there's wisdom and, and administration, whatever, you, you don't keep the converts. Um, the big, you, you know, George Whitefield, ever heard of him? He's one of the most anointed preachers that, in Great Britain. He, he worked together with John Wesley in what's now called the Wesleyan Revival. 
But George Whitefield was probably even the, the more anointed preachers and in the States and so many converts. And man, he, was, he had converts. But so had John Wesley. The difference between the two guys was that Jen, John Wesley was very methodological. That's why it's called Methodism. He had a very clear principle and structure what he did with the new converts. He, took them, he put them into classes. That's what they called them, but really small groups where they were accountable to one another. They asked themselves the question, you know, how are you with Jesus? You know, just imagine you meet with three other guys every week and they ask you the question, how are you with Jesus? Do you have a clean heart? What are you doing with your money? How, how are you in your thought life and marriage? Just imagine you just meet with people and they ask you those questions every week. That's what John Wesley set up. And he had thousands upon thousands of converts that continued to be strong in the faith. And later in life, George Whitefield talked about John Wesley and said, look, he's done it right. And, you know, I should have done what he's done because my followers are like a rope of sand. They disappeared. So do you, do you agree that's not what we want to happen here? I, I want to see you know, new baby Christians go to maturity and become strong in the faith and mature. And we've got to have a church where we facilitate that and that can happen. Okay. Do you, would you agree that Yonggi Cho's story is a God story? God is behind it. So totally anointed, totally God. But um, so that happened, you know, over the last 50, 60 years. Uh, still going strong. But the observation is that certainly outside of Korea, it never got duplicated anywhere else like that. No, no one could take the model and translate it, for instance, to the United States or to Australia. It just didn't work. People tried but they couldn't duplicate it. So, um, you know, Tatiana and I, we caught up with uh, Clark and Ann Taylor probably two weeks ago, and, you know, we talked about stuff and building church. And Clark Taylor, he started more than 150 churches uh, in Australia. So he knows a little bit about building a church, and he said... We worked really, really, really hard on small groups, but we only ever got about 35% of the church signed up to small groups. So is 35% a good number or a bad number? Better than none. You know, like where we're sitting right now, I would take that number and say, yes! But on the other hand, it's not a great number. Hey, it's a third. But 35%, and they worked really hard at it. You, you went to one of his churches and you loved, liked it? <laughs> okay. Um, what he said was instead, what, what he, I think what he favored was that someone has a call to do something, and the Holy Spirit is on that person to do something, and that person gathers a team around him or her, a, a team, and they do something. And while they're doing something, they disciple one another, and, and that, all the small group dynamics where you get to know one another, you share your heart with one another, you love one another, all of that happens while you're doing something. Community. It's community. But it's not just, you know, around Bible study at home, but it's actually, you know... I think the worship bands, for instance, that is a small group. You know, they're doing something, but if when they worship together and catch up and whatever, life life happens and accountability happens and encouragement happens. You know, you, we may get a small group together, you know, maybe taking an interest in school chaplaincy. You know, there's a school just up the road. There, there is actually a chaplain in the school. Maybe a group here gets interested and... You know, to come on board with that. And when you meet to prepare for that and to serve, 
all the small group dynamics happen and you yourself get encouraged and build up. There's also an advantage when you do something. You become hungry to get to know a few things because when you start doing something, you realize all the things that you don't know to do the job. So you have a bit of an incentive to actually learn a little bit about, Jesus, how do you want me to do the job? Then, you know, I could envision maybe there's a group here interested in the persecuted church and, like, you know, specifically pray for, you know, a situation or pastors or people that are in jail somewhere and just have awareness and write a few letters to politicians and just get involved in something. And, you know, that's another small group and you can have a bit of Bible study to begin with and ask each other how you're going. And is that? A way forward or going. Um, there are other churches that go that way. Then um, I, uh, I, I do like, there's, there's a huge church that works with cell groups in the Philippines in Manila. And the, the senior pastor there, one of the top leaders that started it is Steve Morell. Do you, do you like, do you, do you know the name? Steve Morell? Um, and, and he sent one of his leaders to Colombia, because in Colombia there's another church with thousands upon thousands that went there, and they had another small group model. They called it the G12. Ever heard of the G12 small group model? So, you know, modeling it on Jesus. Jesus had 12 disciples, and then, you know, three in the core, and so we do it like Jesus did. Everyone has the 12 disciples, groups of 12. And so this leader went over to... Um, went over to Colombia, and he came back with a report. You know, they asked him, what did you find? What, what is there for us to learn? And this and that. And he said, well, you know, the secret of that church, I don't think is in their system. The secret of that church is in their love for the poor and compassion for the poor and how they pray about it. A church that loves that much and prays for the poor like they do, they will grow no matter what system they use. It's a bit encouraging, hey? So, which... The job is a bit harder. Our passion got to be there. And our, are our hearts actually breaking for the lost? Do we think about eternity and where they will be in eternity? Are, are we weeping over those that don't know Jesus? If we get to a level across the church where that happens, we just can't look. Our heart break for those that are, are lost. Then I think no matter what system we have, it's going to work because it's saturated in love. But, you know, if we have the choice, we may still use a good one. Um, Okay, I come to the first principle. So the, the two types of meeting were in the early church in Jerusalem, the big one where everyone went, and the small one. And they had that for a while, but then the big one dropped away because persecution came, and the whole church, every, thousands of them were scattered everywhere. So they could no longer meet together around the apostles. They were all scattered, and the Bible says, but the apostles remained where they were. So everyone, everyone was separated from the top leaders that used to do all the preaching and ministering in the public square. And yet, even though they only had the small groups, the church thrived and multiplied. Which basically means, which one of the two meetings was the more important one? The small one. You know, the, the, the big one is for training, and yes, you learn culture, and if you, if you can meet in the big meeting, by all means, we do it, because God calls people for that kind of ministry as well. But if that drops away, it doesn't matter, because we've got everything that we need for being church in the small group. You don't need the big group. Two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be right there in their midst. That's what Jesus said. And, and, and the beautiful thing about the Christian faith is that everything, everything that we do is by the Holy Spirit, by the power, by the wisdom, by the insight, by the perseverance, by the holiness of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is given to everyone. How good is that? 
Ah, oh, Erica, where are you? <laughs> They're not responding. <laughs> How good is that? <laughs> Man, like none of us has to depend on their own strength. If you need wisdom, you can ask for wisdom and God can give it to you. And you can have the Holy Spirit immediately right there when you become a Christian on the first day. You know, Stephen Morell, again, he says, it finishes, it, it kills a few myths by which millions of Christians live. The first one is, the pastor always, he has to serve me. You know, I need to be ministered, by, ministered to by the pastor. No, you don't need him. I mean, when he's around, good on you. <laughs> yeah, and I got my wife, hey. <laughs> so that's me. The pastor's job is to minister to me. No, that's not his job. The second one is, I'm not ready yet to be used. Yes, you are. You're more than ready. And the third one is, oh, I have to become mature first before I can be... No, you can mature while you're doing a job. You can learn on the job. So all of that is pretty cool. And the, um, when you read the Bible, so they appointed seven guys to wait at the tables to you know, feed the widows. You know, like they were assigned to hand out food. And then you just read a few verses on... And, you know, two of the seven guys, you actually find out a little bit what they do. And they don't wait. I mean, they may have done their job as well. But the one guy is one of the first ones in Samaria. And he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ with signs and wonders and miracles. And a multitude comes to faith. And I thought, are you sure your job is to wait on tables? It looks like an evangelist to me. Like, you know, but when the Holy Spirit is on you, there's no holding back. And the other guy, his name is Stephen, so he's again, you know, doing morning tea at church. And, and then he's the one that talks to the government of the day and is explaining Jesus to them and reviews the entire history of the people and says, it's all about Jesus and you've always resisted him. And he does it with kind of wisdom that cannot be resisted. It's not because he was so smart. Because the Holy Spirit was on him. The smart people were in the government. So, man. And, you know, building a church, hearing, well, it's everyone's job and we all got a thing to do. You can have a reaction like, ah, oh, sounds like we're going to be busy and it's going to be hard. And, you know, mm, I just like to sit here. I like the worship service on Sunday, but otherwise leave me alone. So you, you might fight it a little bit. But look at it with different eyes. I mean, what greater privilege is there than to be used by Jesus to bring other people into an eternal relationship with him and to have that person one day in eternity with you because you were obedient and God used you. I mean, how, I mean what great privilege it is to be used by God. And he gives you a job. And when you do a job, he says, well done, I give you another one. And to actually enjoy the experience of him doing things that you can't do yourself. That, you know, he leads us into visions that are beyond ourselves. That's a life of adventure. And it's a life of meaning. It actually matters. Then your life matters. And what's the alternative? What's the alternative? You entertain yourself until you die and then you're done. You know, watch, watch TV and what for? Anyway, that's... I think all of us, hey, we want our lives to matter. So, I tell you another cool thing in church history. And Yonggi Cho is an example as well. When you build small, that's the principle, build small. Big meeting, small meeting, focus on the small. So, you know, we want to grow, have the church growing. We may focus maybe on the big meeting and how many people turn up on Sunday. 
that's actually not the number that counts. The number that counts is the one that actually live where they can actually love one another and encourage one another and build each other up and sing spiritual songs to one another, where they actually live in community. And when that happens, that's the strength of the church. So the big numbers is deceptive. The strength of the church is in all those small groups, all those small relationships, all the friendships that are forming, where people are actually thriving and living and living out their faith. So build small. That's, that's principle number one. And when you build small, um, you know, in the right way, you know, with the blessing of God, the small can multiply at a speed that you can't even follow it. You know, all, all, all over the world, like, you get reports saying, oh, we planted 15 house groups, and then we went on a three-month holiday, and now we've come back, and, and the numbers have doubled, but they actually may be two or three times that much. We actually don't know how many groups there are. They're, they're, man, the mind boggles. Even in town, there's a New Hope Church under Pastor Chris Mull here. You know, he, he probably in town, he's the one that is doing a lot with small groups. Um, you know, he had that experience, you know, a new one started and no one knew about it. That's what you want. The small multiplies. Everything that you need to have church, all the expertise and knowledge that is there, it can just easily multiply and... Man, wouldn't we like it to lose track of the numbers of people that are just meeting in small groups everywhere? Okay, principle number one is build small. Principle number two is make sure that it's easily reproducible. So it can easily be reproduced. So, which basically means... You get the principle in overseas mission work. That's where we often go wrong. Because, let's say, you go to another country and you take your idea of church with you. So you take another country where they're not building with the kind of building material. They don't know any of that. But you go and you build a brick church with a bell tower, stained glass window and pews in it. Right? When there none, none of those buildings exist there, they actually meet under trees when they want to have a meeting. But because you say, that's what church is, then everyone there thinks, oh, that's what church is. So if you want to have a church, we've got to find the money to have a brick building, we've got to import from Europe a stained glass window and have a bell tower. Like That immediately limits it because no one got the finances to do it. That's actually another big one. If you want to, in any mission work, if you want to have a reproducible work where it can just go anywhere like that, you can't be dependent on foreign money. Because uh, there's always comes to an end of the money. Um, and then you have resentment and all of that stuff happening and you don't need it. Does that, does that make sense? So, reproducible... Don't introduce any element that cannot not be easily duplicated. So, the, the, And when you think about that one, the, the beauty of Yonggi Cho was it, it could be duplicated endlessly. Because anyone could do it. Like, you know, you get the notes and, you know, the midweek teaching from Yonggi Cho and cassette. You take the notes, you have a brief worship order, you have a few do's and don'ts, an hour, and do this, do that. Anyone could do it that is willing to put in the time. Um, you know, other successful programs like that in a church, you know, Rick Warren, Saddleback Church. Um, do you know how they do it? It actually went over, over the whole world, 2007, the Purpose Driven Life. Yeah, we've, we've done it as well. And how, why did it work? Because anyone could do it. Like you go to the Christian bookshop, you get the pack, and you do it's all mapped out, step one, step two, step three. So any pastor, like any pastor with no training of setting up a campaign in the church, whatever, could do it. Like four months out, do this, three months out, do this, two months out, do this. And then when it finally came to the campaign, 
the, the components were the Sunday preaching was alongside the topics. And every preacher, every pastor prepared his own sermon. But uh, Rick Warren gave you that much material so you couldn't miss. You could, you could certainly write a sermon with all the ideas he gave. And then the core component of the, 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 the whole study was that all the leader had to do is come in my home. I got a VCR. We had VCRs at the time. So a video, you show a video of Rick Warren talking for 20 minutes and then you got a study guide and you just go through the questions. Anyone can do it. No one needed to be a Bible teacher or an expert, whatever. The structure, everything was just ready made. And that's why it went all over the world. Um, a lot of places everywhere, they use notes. I find it interesting that New Hope in Toowoomba is not using notes prepared by a pastor. But they also make it reproducible so anyone can do it. You want to know how I, what they do? Interesting. That's what I think. So I haven't seen it in action, but this is how it works. They use a Bible study method called SOAP. It's an acronym. So it's very simple. S stands for scripture. So the whole group agrees on maybe a scripture that they use for their private devotions leading up to the small group meeting. So they have a scripture, and the O in soap, the O stands for observation. So you just make an observation about what you're reading. Oh, that's strange. Oh, that's cute. Oh, that's challenging. You just find something, have, a, have an observation. And then the A stands for application. Oh, th this is interesting. Application, oh, this is what it could mean for me. Oh, this is maybe what God wants to say to me in that Bible passage. And you just make it personal. So you have scripture, you have observation, you have application, and then you have a prayer out of it. Jesus, oh, this is really convicting me. Please help me. The next week that in that area of my life, help me to just be obedient to you. And then when they come together in the small group, all they do is share from the same Bible passage what each what everyone got. And they talk a bit about that, and then they pray about it, they pray for one another, and then that's it. Do you agree? It's easy. Anyone can do it. You don't need an expert. So, you know, with the, with the Bible passage that we just had, uh, in, um, in Acts chapter 2, you find out that they meet daily and have meals together. The Christians have daily meals together. So you may think, oh, that's an interesting observation. Application is, maybe I invite someone over for dinner that I meet in church. Would you agree? So that's not difficult to do. I'm almost at the end. So principle number one is build small. Principle number two was make it reproducible. Don't introduce an element where you know you take fear you, four years of full-time study before anyone can do it. Like do it in a way that anyone can do it, and it's easy and it's fun. Simple, easy, and fun. That's what uh, Chris Malher says. Simple. Everyone can understand how it works. Easy. Everyone can do it, and fun. It's encouraging. Okay, those are the two principles. Next Saturday, we're going to talk a little bit about. Structure, that's where we have our, you know, just touch base on this. Um, but my last point, this is, this is a key point. Homework, before we can any, do any of that, you know, and we may have small groups or we may have service teams or we may have pre-prepared notes or not, we may just have a spontaneous whatever before, before we just decide on any of that, what needs to happen? Prayer. Yeah, prayer, I agree. But something, uh, I'll read it to you, and you tell me whether you can actually do it. The way you are right now, and with the way your life is, can you actually do it? They devoted themselves to the fellowship. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Why doesn't it work the way we are right now? 
can't, so? Not be devoted. Yeah, yeah, not being devoted. Yes, and when you're devoted to something, what does it translate into? Time. 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 Really, time. Time. Yet, yeah. see, our hearts may respond to the message, and the commitment is there, and we want to do it. And you know, if Jesus says build a church and you know reach out to the lost, we may say yes to it. I think all of us, I mean, reading your faces, no, no one is disagreeing. We all say yes to it. But it cannot work if you want to keep your week the same and do that on top of it. It's a recipe for burnout. You, you, you agree? So uh, this, this is the homework. So in, in order for, that, for any, any system to work or you to be part of anything of building a church, you've got to be absolutely ruthless and go through the, your week and start getting rid of things. You've got to find time because we can only do so much. And, and actually... You know, Jesus loves us. Do, do you know that? He, he, he actually does love us. So he doesn't want us to live a life burdened and 18 hours, days, and, you know, no joy, and your, your, your nerves are always frayed, and you're always snapping at everyone because you're a Christian, you're building the church. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm talking about. So I, I don't give you a lot of wisdom around it, but it's rearranging our time. Because in the early church, when the Holy Spirit fell, church was everything. That's what they lived for. They were devoted to the fellowship. This was their number one deal of their lives. Church wasn't just an add-on. You know, oh, I go there on a Sunday, some, you know, maybe not every Sunday, but I'll be there on Sunday. In the early church, it was completely different. That was their life, their priority. That's where they lived. And for, for us, to, that to happen, we've we got we to gotta find time. And it is actually there. It is there. Amen. Amen. No, no. Jesus, thank you. Oh. Do you find it challenging or encouraging? Because Hadi just said you've got to be told. So, yeah, but when Jesus tells us, when you hear it, is it burdensome to you or a bit encouraging as well? Encouraging. It's, it's a bit of both. A bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. So changes need to happen. But I am encouraged that Jesus actually cares about us and he speaks to us and he got plans. To me, it's that we have to lay down everything. Yes. Oh, Myrna, come on. You have too much wisdom not to use the microphone. <laughs> come on. Um. God's been speaking to me actually through another book I've been reading and he says, you lay, when you come to this situation, you lay down everything, everything before God and you ask him what you take up so that he allows then the things that aren't important are what you can lay down and give it to God and he will show you what you can take up and what you can do. You want to pray. <sighs> Father God, you call us to build a church. And we have learned and we have heard many different ways and different situations. But Father God, I believe what you are calling us to do is to lay down everything before you. Lay down everything so that you can show us 
what you want us to take up to build this church. Father God, give us the wisdom, give us the instructions and help us because without you we can do nothing. Help us to lay down everything, which means our whole total life and lay it down before you so that you can give us the directions and guidance to show us what we can take up to build our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Christina. So not our agenda. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Be on God's agenda. Amen. Yes. Yeah, watch what God is doing and join him rather than the other way around. Amen. I dob in someone else to pray. It's you, Christine. Another woman, but I know community is on your heart. So maybe you can come here and just pray for that community. And Do, do you know... That's what God wants, but that's actually what everyone else wants. We all want to live in relationships where we're loved, yeah. isn't it? There's no condemnation and encouragement. And, and we live in a culture where a lot of people are alone and alienated. So, man, make the, God, make the church like you designed it. Yes, Lord. You designed us to belong. We all have a need to belong. And we thank you, Lord, that um, first of all, we belong to you. We look to you to get our sense of identity. We look to you for, for everything. We look to you for our provision. We look to you for our sense of um, who we are. Thank you, Lord. But you... We also need to look to one another. It's vertical, but it's also horizontal. And we all want to belong in a loving community. We all want to feel that we um, belong somewhere. And so, Lord, I just pray as we, as we um, thrash out this, how do we do this, Lord? Uh, Lord, it needs to be corporate. It needs to be everybody in on it. And so, Lord, I just pray this week that we would just take time out. We would spend time with you because you speak to us and we hear you. And so, Lord, um, and when there's a corporate coming together, lots of people hear the same thing. And so we need to be all asking the same question. And we need to just take time out with you this week, Lord, just to be asking, Lord, how do you want us to do this? so that we can come together corporately and know that we have heard from you. It's not just one person who hears, it's everybody. And so, Lord, I just ask that you will download into our hearts what you have for us and how you want us to do this um, over, the ne- over the coming weeks, Lord. Thank you that you speak to us. Thank you that you love us enough that you want to, to guide us and walk with us and be there um, every day with us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And uh, thank you, Christine. Glenn, c- can I c- call you up as well to pray? And um, what I thought that maybe you pray is just compassion for the world out there, for the lost. And G- Glenn is a policeman in the Lockyer and I'm sure you see quite a bit of the underbelly and people hurting and all sorts of stuff going on. So, And I know you've got a heart for it. So maybe just release it over the church. Lord, we all, um, we all meet here together. And we all come from different families, Lord. And there's uh, so many members of our families that, that don't even know you. So it's not just in the community, but it's in our own families, in our own bloodlines. We'll just pray blessings over our family members that 
that are lost and are searching still, Lord, that they would come to find you. Lord, help us to be lights shining for you, Lord, that you would shine out of us for not just the community but for our own families, Lord. We, we, we desperately want to dwell in heaven with our own family and with the community, Lord. Just pour out your blessings, your power on the communities we live in and the families that we also um, do our lives with, Lord. So just come and be with us, Lord. Dwell over this whole city and over all the communities that we live in. In Jesus' name. And, and Lord, I just pray for all of us this coming week that you keep speaking to us. Lord, that you draw near to us, that we hear your voice. And Lord, you know, if it's a little bit challenging, Lord, we know that it is done out of love. And Lord, you, you encourage us because you're knocking on the door and you're asking us to open up because you want to do things. You want to do things in this church. You want to make us a church that is useful to you, that is bearing fruit. And, and Lord, we may not grow like, you know, the Yoda Food Gospel Church. That may not be our call. But whatever, whatever you want to do among us, we want to be a healthy church that hears your voice and obeys. And Lord, we want to have among us, and each and every one of us, we want people that we are leading to a saving relationship with you. Lord, that eyes open up and ears open up and people recognize you as their saviour for all eternity. Lord, I pray, pour it over the church. God, get us ready. Give us revelation. Give us wisdom as what you want to do among us. In your name we pray. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.